Uh, but we're going to turn the dart on. Now the gases have already been turned on, so we go click the off button and you see it toggles to on. There's a little uh, leaning man icon, which is the standby icon. Uh, uh, let's see, I clicked it twice. Okay, now the dart's on. We're in standby mode, so the little guy's standing by. Uh, we turn the dart on, we'll, we'll click this and you see everything will be running. Um, if you want to know what's actually happening, this piece of paper here is the parameter page. Now, I think that's an unfortunate choice of icons because it's right next to another piece of paper icon, which, which is uh, the error message thing. But this is the one that just gives you an overview of what the dart's doing. So, uh, if you remember from the talk earlier, you've got a high voltage on the needle. You've got about 3,500 volts on the, the glow discharge needle. Then there are two electrodes, and they're set to... Uh, 150 and in this case 650 volts. Uh, I usually run, well actually uh, th these are parameters that Roger's been using. I, I'm going to switch this one back to uh, 250 for the time being at the grid electrode. Uh, and then the gas temperature is set to about 250 degrees C right now which is enough to get cocaine off of dollar bills and things like that. Uh, the gas temperature is a parameter. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the lab. But I mean, basically, uh, you've got thermally assisted desorption. So if something's hotter, it makes it easier to get materials off the surface, but it also could damage a surface. So you just uh, use uh, 250s, a pretty good general temperature. That's the gas heater temperature. The actual gas temperature depends on what the gas flow rate is and how far are you away from the opening because gas is cooling things down. So it, uh, the, the hottest temperature is going to be right next to the dart. So the dart's on right now, and there's a, a gas flow rate down there. Uh, beware that this gas flow rate is only approximate. If you really want to know what the gas flow rate is, uh, right now the best thing to do is just put a flow meter on the output. Uh, otherwise, it's not guaranteed to be reproducible. It's just a valve that opens and closes. Uh, so we'll just uh, actually we'll just we'll just turn this off for the moment. Now let's just see what the parameters are. When we go to standby mode, all it does is turn off the high voltages and it switches from helium to nitrogen, so that the uh, uh, you're not wasting helium when you're not actually doing anything. So then uh, we'll turn on the mass center main program, which is the uh, mass spec control program. We'll use this for acquiring data and for turning the mass spec on and off, but we're going to use uh, a, a TSS Pro 3 shredder software to, to process the data. It's just easier and faster and more intuitive. Uh, okay, this comes up, and there are two pages. This is the, you can't see the whole screen here, but this is the mess center main page. This is just really the, uh, a point of reference for, the main thing you want to use this page for is uh, getting to the instrument, this warm-up button up here. Uh, this will turn you to the, the tuning page. And the other thing is the stop button over here, which uh, is grayed out right now because we're not actually measuring anything. So the first thing I'm going to go is, is, is turn on the, the instrument tune page. And I usually, I usually just get here by going to the little icon. You can also uh, go to the instrument tune manager uh, menu button. But I'm going to click on this. This is going to open a, another page, which will show you a little diagram of the instrument and some parameters. Uh, there will be a lot more parameters than you actually need to worry about. I'll point out the ones that are important. The uh, first most important thing is uh, that there will be a window for the analyzer and for the source. We're only going to look at two parameters, on one on each of those pages. This is a peak monitor right now. Nothing's on yet, so you don't see anything except noise. And the instrument is in warm-up mode. It's not in operate mode. <coughs> so we'll go up here and turn the instrument to operate mode and let's see if the detector is off we want to set the voltage to I think 2600 volts if, uh, if you see something that's yellow that means it's changing as soon as it's white that means it's stable so as soon as uh, there we go now now the detector is on you start seeing some <coughs> background stuff uh, this is just you know, it's, it's actually low-level background. When we put a sample in front of this, this will be a whole lot stronger. Let me show you the two parameters again uh, that will be important in all of our discussions. If you go to the ion source, click over here. This is the orifice voltage. Uh, 
raising that from 20 to, to 60 to 90 or whatever the voltages are that, uh, that Bob will be talking about will cause more fragmentation. Uh, it's pretty hard to see with just this noisy background stuff. So I'm going to lower the, the RF ion guide voltage so you can see the water and air peaks. That, that's on the analyzer tab. So ignoring all of this stuff right here, uh, I'll show you. I mean, ignore the needle voltages, no electrospray needle. Uh, the orifice voltages are all set the way you like it. Uh, the one thing is that the uh, orifice temperature is set to 80 degrees C. Uh, you do want to heat the orifice. It, it contracts the hole a little bit so that you don't blow too much helium in the vacuum system. It also helps to keep things clean. Um, the number is kind of arbitrary. I started using 80 in my lab. Now I'm doing 120 in my lab. But whatever it is, just stick with the same value and you'll be fine. It just helps to keep things clean. Uh, if you get it too hot, it'll be hard to, you don't want to stick your finger in there because then you'll be touching a hot surface, but uh, otherwise it's not really important. So, uh, uh, not, all these gases are turned off. These have to do with the electrospray source. The only important thing here really is the orifice voltage. And in the analyzer, there are a couple of tabs here with all kinds of voltages. Don't change anything except this one right here where it says peaks voltage. The others are the instrument tuning. and you should have saved uh, a, a stable set of conditions that you can get back to in case you type a wrong value in a box someplace. These are all saved in a file someplace so we can re retrieve them. And in the regular training courses, I'll show you how to make a backup copy of default parameters in case somebody in your lab types in the wrong number someplace. But right here, I'm just going to look at this. So I remember I said that the peak's voltage is uh, an estimate of the lowest mass you're going to see. Take that number and divide by 10. And you'll see the lowest mass around here is probably around 60. It's not a, a sudden thing. It's probably got some curvature to it. But you're roughly around mass 60 and higher that you're seeing. So if, if we were to lower this to, let's say, 100, we're not going to see mass 10, but we will see low masses. Now, remember I showed you earlier that the 37 peak is the water dimer. So water is 18. 2 times 18 plus 1 is 37. That's... Uh, that's our low mass background. And this, this looks pretty much like the slide I show you, maybe even a little better. Uh, hardly any uh, low mass stuff here. Let me just try lowering this a little bit. These things are slightly different on each instrument. I want to see a little bump down. There you go. There's a little bit of 18 and 19 there. So there's a little bit of ammonium. There's a little bit of water and mostly water dimer here. Okay, that water dimer is not very stable, so if we increase the orifice voltage, it's going to break apart to, to H3O+. Plus. So this gives me an example I can show you of fragmenting things without having to go in the lab and put a sample in front of it. All right, so we, we looked at three, three parameters. We, we raised the multiplier voltage from zero. It goes to zero when you're in standby mode because you don't want to burn out your multiplier prematurely. Uh, the multipliers have a pretty long lifetime, by the way, but we want to be conservative and protect them. So when we're not using measurement, you'll see in the, the shutdown procedure, it says to set the multiplier voltage to zero and set the instrument to warm-up mode. We just came back out of warm-up mode, and so we, we went back from warm-up to operate, and we turned the multiplier on. Then the other two parameters, again, are this, this peak's voltage, which is the low mass, the lowest mass you're going to see, and the... Uh, uh, orifice voltage. Peak's voltage is in the analyzer. It's in the mass spec part. The orifice voltage is in the source interface. So that's in the source tab. Here we go. So watch, watch what happens if I raise this to, let's say, 60 volts. A little delay while things catch up. You see, the, the water dimer is broken apart to water monomer. If you had a more complicated molecule, you'd get more complicated fragmentation. But at least it shows you how things work. And you'll see a lot more examples in Bob's talk. Uh, OK, so we're going to go back to the standard conditions. I'm going to put this back to 20. For today, all I want to do is just measure things. I don't want to break anything apart yet. Bob? Oh, sure. Good idea. You want to see what the peak shapes actually look like. Uh, is that enough or more? Let's, let's zoom a little more. You can actually see. These are low masses. By the way, the, uh, the resolving power is less at low mass on a, on a time of flight. So you see it says the resolution is only about 1,700. That's okay for mass 18. At mass 600, it's going to be about 6,000. 
Uh, luckily, that works out in our favor because at low mass we don't need as much resolution because there aren't that many things to separate. Uh, but there is some, some junk in the background here. There's some, there's some tailing. The peak has a shape to it. Uh, there are only so many data points across these peaks. They're really at low mass and they're really narrow. Let's, uh, let's set this back to a normal value and look at a larger mass just so you can see what it looks like. Again, these are the only two parameters uh, I want you to look at, just the, the orifice 1 voltage and the peaks voltage. For, our, for the lab, let's just set, to, set these to fixed values and leave them there for right now. Just, just beware that those are the important ones. So we'll set this back. Uh, so that's set to 20. Uh, if you double click on this peak monitor, it'll zoom back out again. Uh, if you want to set the, the, the mass range and, and the acquisition speed, you can point to the peak monitor and right click and you get a menu and it allows you to set up what the display parameters are. Again, we don't need to change this for the lab, but just so you know it's there. Right now I've got it acquiring from mass 10 to 700 at about one second acquisition. So we're doing one spectrum per second. You can go as fast as 10 spectra per second, but no faster right now. And let's see. That's it right now. The mass range, by the way, is good up to 10,000, but DART's only good up to about 1,000 to 2,000 uh, for molecular weights. Uh, most things under 1,000 will work. Uh, some things under 2,000 will work. Okay, uh, now here's our mass 37 peak. Oops. And you can see already the, the measured mass resolution, the resolving power is about 2,500. So it's about double what it was uh, at mass 19. And the intensity is a number that that's, uh, you know, that is a relative value. If you were to set the dart up for the first time, you'd want to adjust the angle and position everything to maximize this this water peak. Uh, when that's that's really strong and you have good signal noise and everything's ready to go. Okay, we'll do one more thing uh, and then we'll go into the lab. Uh, I'm just going to show you how to make a, uh, a measurement. We're, we don't have any sample in front of it so we're just going to measure the background. Uh, so I'm going to leave the peaks voltage at 100 so you can see these low mass peaks. We'll save them to a data file and then show you how to open the data file. Uh, okay, double click back to here. Uh, to measure a uh, sample, this software doesn't have the easy run button, so we're just going to use the, the, the single acquisition wizard. What that is is just you're making a single measurement to a data file. It's uh, just going to ask you for the name of data file and ask you to confirm what masses you want to measure and how fast you want to measure them. So we'll go up here to where it says acquire and start acquisition. This is in the appendix of the, uh, the notes uh, because the notes were written assuming you just have the the easy run button, which just asks you to enter a file name and nothing else. Uh, this isn't much more complicated. It just allows you to see what the other questions are. Okay, a first page, ignore it, hit next. This just says, do you want to load some previously stored setup? Uh, we do need to give this a file name, and uh, there are places to put notes. So let's put some notes. Let's give it a file name first under acquisition data. Uh, oops. I'm going to use short titles while we're in here. Uh, any notes you put in there are saved in the data file and will be uh, accessible in the future for documentation purposes. So use note fields whenever you can. Okay, that's all you have to put there. You do have to say where it gets saved. So data is stored in projects and projects are stored in folders. Right now we're just going to set a folder up which has today's date right now. So that's, uh, we're just working within uh, the 081208 uh, folder right there. But go look for your data later. There, you should organize them according to projects and folders. Okay, next page. Uh, you get three choices of how you want to set up the data. First one is just use whatever parameters you see on the screen here and save data that way. Uh, it's a matter of how you like to run your lab. I like to use the, the middle one, which allows you to specifically view what parameters you're going to use that day. So that's really just going to be mass range and 
storage speed and, and how long this, the spectrum is going to run. The third one is to use uh, a previous existing program. Uh, we haven't created a program yet, so let's ignore that. But if you've already told the mass spec how to acquire data, you'd use that button. We're going to use the middle one right now, just so you can see what it's doing. Ignore the rest of it, because the rest of it has to do with LCs, and we don't have any LCs hooked up. So, again, this one is just use whatever you see on the screen right here, acquire data. This one is show you what the parameters are and let you approve them. And this one is use a stored program. This pointer is really uh, not cooperating. OK, on this page, really only a couple of important things. Start and ending mass. Uh, we want to lower the starting mass because this was set up to go from mass 60. So let's set mass 10 in there. Let's make this a small data file. There's not going to be anything interesting at high mass right now. So let's just acquire up to mass 200 or even 150, just arbitrary number. Uh, the stop time means it'll stop acquiring at 10 minutes unless you press the stop button first. So that's good enough. We're not going to run for 10 minutes. We'll press the stop button. And the recording interval means it'll store one spectrum per second. For Dart, that's pretty good. Most things don't happen much faster than that. Ignore the rest of this. Um, you can acquire uh, spectra in different ways. I like to acquire profile spectra, which means you see the whole peak shape. Uh, centroided data means you just get a straight line where each peak is. But if you can see the peak shape and you have a problem later, you can go back and look at your peak shape and see if there, you know, things make sense. So let's just stick with that. That's the default. There are no macros we're running. Skip that page. We're not going to do anything other than just record the, the mass spectrum, view the mass spectrum and, and the, the total ion current in real time. If you want to look for specific masses in runtime, you can type their, their masses into a box there. If you wanted to see uh, you know, cocaine on dollar bills, you could program it to look for mass 304 in runtime. It's just uh, a real-time monitor. It doesn't have to change the recorded data. OK, and then we're done. Uh, at any time there, if you were sure the rest of those pages had the right parameters in them, you could just hit the Finish button. So we'll finish here. This page is prompting you about whether you want to save that stuff for future use, but we don't care about that right now. OK, this is going to open. Uh, I told it to open a, a spectrum viewer and a chromatogram viewer in real time. So it's going to start by opening those. If you could see the bottom toolbar, you see it's starting to open a spectrum viewer here. Once these are open, they don't have to be reopened again. They, they can be left open. And then it's going to open a chromatogram viewer. and Nothing is really acquired until you press the Start Run button right here. OK, as soon as we do that, we're starting to put data into a file. The update speed may not match the acquisition speed. It may be a little slower than that, but it's not so bad. If we were putting samples in front of this, something would change, but we aren't. So you're just seeing the background spectrum. It's being saved to a data file right now. We'll let this go for a few seconds, and then we'll shut it down. Uh, now this will be easier to see in the lab, but the mass center main page down here has a little checkerboard icon. Uh, on some machines it's red and blue and some uh, red and red and white and others it's blue and white. I have no idea why it's different because it's the same icon. But look for a little checkerboard icon and that's the one that has the stop button on it. So we'll go down here and click on that and here's our red stop button. So to stop acquisition we're going to press that. Don't be confused because the one right next to it says stop MS acquisition and it has a blue button. That one's for use with an auto sampler. Uh, if you had a whole series of samples uh, set up in an auto sampler, you could press that one and it would halt them. Just press the red button that says stop. And uh, that will close the data file. So what we'll do when we get in the lab, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run more, one more for you in front of the machine. We'll run an actual sample, look for a cocaine on a dollar bill or, or something else, and uh, get an exact mass from it. But OK, now, now the acquisition has stopped. If we're not going to measure any more samples right away, let's go back to the Dart and click on the little running man. And now we're in standby mode. Uh, so now we're not wasting helium, and we don't really need it. And now, now data acquisition is done. Uh, the one more thing we could do is just open the data file uh, and look at it. Uh, I'm not going to open this file. I'm going to open one that we measured earlier that, that has a calibration in it because I want you to see what that does. Uh, let's just, this is uh, actually on the, on the desktop.
This is the uh, data acquisition program, TSS Pro 3. Uh, we're just going to do data reduction, data processing. And here's a, uh, here's a file we opened a minute ago. Now, this is, uh, this is a dollar bill. There's some doctal phthalate on it, and there's some cocaine right there, uh, 304.1549, which is really a pretty good measurement. We got lucky. Uh, but let me show you how we got there. Uh, we started with an Accutoff data file, and we translated the Accutoff data file. So it's file translate Accutoff file. And we have to find where we stored the data. By default, it's going to be in this uh, folder right here. If you click on this folder, you'll see our two spectra over here that we just, uh, one I collected in the lab a minute ago and the one we just collected. I'm going to repeat the, uh, this one with the dollar bill in it, and I'm just going to open it. Now, what we did was I measured some polyethylene glycol reference compound, and then I measured the dollar bill. So the reference is in the data file with the sample. The software is going to go in. It's going to find the reference compound. It's going to calibrate on it, and then it's just going to, everything will be exact. Uh, you won't see any messages unless there's a problem. And if there's a problem, then it'll ask you, you know, what do you want? Do you want to accept this, or do you want to correct something? Uh, you're seeing uh, it's a total ion current chromatogram here. So here's where I measured the polyethylene glycol, and then here's where I stuck the dollar, dollar bill in front of it. This is just there to show you which data file you're looking at. So I'm just going to say open. And then it's going to prompt me for uh, an initial calibration. We have ones that says Ames Dart positive dot cal. That just tells it how to find peaks. You've got to tell the mass spec uh, the software at some point. You know how to how to recognize which mass is which. You've got times and intensities, and it has to know that time x is, is mass z or whatever. So this, this may not be exact, but it's going to be close enough that all the masses will be labeled correctly. Then you just say, OK, let it translate the data file. And it calibrated on the, the PEG spectrum. You saw the flicker. Everything's calibrated now. Uh, you don't have to do anything because there wasn't a problem. We will see a problem sometime during the, the next two days, and I'll show you what to do with it when we get there, if, if some mass is misassigned or some peaks are missing or something like that. Uh, here's what you're seeing now. Uh, there are three windows. There's a mass spectrum window on the bottom. A, it's not really a chromatogram, but it is a total ion current versus time plot. It would only be a chromatogram if we had a, an LC hooked up to it. But this is your index. Each one of these data points is a different spectrum. And if you click up here, you'll see a mass spectrum down here. There's one thing you need to know about the software, and it'll confuse the daylights out if you don't know about it. See this little window up here? This is a, it's a blown up region of, of this plot. If you click here, and this point is in this window up here, it's going to show you the biggest point in this window. So the best thing to do is to uh, just go up here and click on what you want in, in this window. Uh, you can arrange this vertically or horizontally. It might be easier to see if I do this. Uh, just set your windows up the way you like to work with them. But this is my polyethylene glycol peak. If I wanted to average it, I could just drag the cursor across here and say I want to average all of those spectra. I'm sorry, that's, that's the dollar bill. That's, that's not the, the polyethylene glycol. If I wanted to go over here and see the, the reference compound, I'll just drag and average right there. And that's, that's what the reference spectrum looked like. So it's, it's a polymer that you know, gives you a repeat unit every 44 mass units. We know what it is, so we know what the masses are. The software is just going to go find all of those known peaks from a list and create a curve fit and uh, then figure out the polynomial terms and apply them to mass calibration so that everything comes out right. But remember, I, I told you cocaine should be 304.15488. So we go back to our dollar bill. Uh, there we go. We've got, well, in this case, we've got an average spectrum. It's 304.1537. So we're within 1.1 millimass unit of the uh, uh, expected value. But it's pretty close. We've also got a, a 391 peak, which uh, I guess I'll save as an exercise for when we get in the lab and want to try to figure out what it is. But uh, I can tell you what most of those things are by looking at them. Uh, but we'll let the software do that for you. Um, 
Okay, so there we go. Now we've, we've uh, collected a spectrum, we've uh, opened it up and calibrated it, and then we can view the data. So that's, that's where we want to uh, start right now. If we have time later, we'll look at data interpretation. So let's stop there and go into the lab and do this for real.